Good evening. This evening we're in conversation with Jonathan Bugden. Jonathan will be sharing his journey around metamorphosis of Ecclesia from his time spent with God, from journaling, from praying, from sharing. And Restoration House itself has been journeying in some ways through metamorphosis. We now meet in various groups, various locations, locally, nationally, and now internationally. We focus on relationship with God and one another as our main purpose for being together, and our ministry flows out of that. We seek to honour and serve other expressions of Ecclesia while seeking to stay faithful to our unknown path that the Lord is leading us on. We have lots of questions around structure, leadership, apostolic and prophetic, and how the ministries work outlined as in Ephesians 4. But we want to be mature sons who are led by the Spirit, following the cloud and the fire, even though our flesh sometimes wants conformity and security. So we look forward to hearing from Jonathan and from one another as we talk together tonight in the fear of the Lord, Malachi 3.16 being one of our key, key verses. So thank you, Jonathan. Just start us off and, and take us away with your thoughts. Okay, thanks very much, Chris, and uh, hello to everybody. Um, I think um, probably I passingly know uh, Phil and Sue, and I know very well Hugh, but I probably don't know anybody else. So um, uh, it's just really nice to meet new people and to find others having similar conversations and journeys. Um, I'm hoping that everybody's had the notes. Um, Chris asked me to um, share or start conversation around um, the whole subject. Uh, I mean, metamorphosis is a bit pompous, but it kind of gives the impression and, and the concept of transition and paradigm shift and change that goes beyond um, rearranging the furniture that goes beyond um, a little adjustment here and there um, and is more to do with heralding a new, uh, an emerging epoch, a new era. It isn't just, it, it, it's not just um, some change we have to adjust to, but is actually a pivotal moment in history. And um, what an amazing privilege to be alive at this time. Uh, how amazing that God would choose I us to be alive. Um, at such an incredible season. So the notes, um, obviously I could have written reams and reams, um, but I didn't want to do that. Um, so it's really a fly pass. So what I've done is just pick out some words that help to shape um, uh, a perception. So uh, I think probably we're in a, in a similar situation with one another that um, sometimes it feels like the Lord's telling us a little bit ahead, but he's not telling us very much about uh, where the road is going. And so um, to have a some kind of uh, perception vision of what what's happening and, and where this is leading, even if it's a, you know, through a through a glass darkly to to quote the AV, um, it, there is a sense of A, being prepared to navigate um, such a time, and secondly, as in Sons of Issachar, being very aware of the day in which we live and what God has said about it, is saying about it. Um, so this is just a fly past it's not teaching. I'm not a theologian. I'm not an academic. Um, this is something that um, is just come out of my uh, unusual lifestyle in the last six or seven years. Um, and in the notes, you'll find um, that I put, I decided to be quite vulnerable because I feel that um, leadership that can't be vulnerable is very limited in how much of a blessing it can be. So I've been quite vulnerable in sharing um, things that the Lord has said to me or prophetic words that I've had in the last six year period, just really to give you a sense of why I'm saying some of the things I'm saying and 
something of the journey that uh, we've traveled. Um, so just looking at the, the notes that I sent, I put them into three categories, really. So looking at what might happen um, in terms of how we function as community, how we function as ecclesia, how we live as family. Um, I've the first section is what will characterize this and I could have written 30 40 things so I've just tried to make it like you know uh, digestible so very simply used words alliteratively just to make it easier and then the second section is what will be absent so in other words what will characterize it and what will be absent from it really depicts the transition that we're in from and to so we on this journey we are losing some things and some things are emerging and then uh, the third section is how do we prepare for what um i was going to say lies ahead in many ways it's not ahead it's now ready um obviously it will uh, evolve going forward but um it's already here we're not living in we're not talking about a season that's coming we're talking about a season that we're already living in and have been for a few years um and in many ways what i'm what i'm covering is not is is more about our who we are as an individual than it is about the structure of church the only thing i want to really draw your attention to is that one of the um, words that I had in 2018 um, I'd been being pestered by people to say it's great stuff what you what you're saying but we want to know we want a model to build church going forward so um, I was very impertinent and I really um, persisted in saying to the Lord I really want to know if there's a model what does it look like and in the end almost I feel to uh, stop me going on and on about it and move on he said to me the only model of church which is viable beyond the short term is the model of the underground church so um that's kind of specifically and um uh, very definitely uh to do with church and how it operates most of what I'm going to talk about now applies equally to us as individuals as it does to the collective. Um, certainly in terms of the last section of how do we how do we prepare, how do we realign, how how does God recalibrate us? Those things are very much to do with uh, our own individual relationship and walk. Um, because, of course, we can't have a. We can't have a church that changes the world unless it's got people in it who are changed and transformed individuals. Um, so for the church to uh, morph into something um, that prepares us for um, the return of Jesus, then uh, there are some things that need to happen. Um, and uh, they happen first with us on an individual basis before they happen on a collective basis just want to make that point so very quickly then looking at the three sections uh, what will characterize ecclesia um you can see that i've put i think it's eight um things beginning with s so um i'm just going to go through them simple we've made our spiritual life and church far too complicated far too complex far too structured um, and uh, I suppose that part of the um, part of what I see is a beautiful simplicity with minimal organization and maximum relationship but it requires us as individuals to have the wonderment of a child the dependence of a child dependence on the Lord um, uh, rather than our cleverness so the whole thing about you know um us seeming to be foolish you know the wisdom of the the wisdom of the wise is inferior to the kind of childlike wisdom uh, 
that comes from Revelation. So simple. Um, this may be slightly contentious, I don't know, but small. I believe God said to me that um, globalization is an anti-kingdom concept. Um, make of that what you will. Um, but uh, I believe that we're coming into a time which if you just refer back to what I said about the, the model for church being underground, uh, clearly small, not, not mega. mega. Mega can only exist as a state church. So, so we're back to the whole thing of home-based. And um, there's, there's one thing, I didn't put it in here, but um, once when I was meeting with Hugh and Ginny, um, there was this phrase that the Lord gave to both my wife and to Ginny, uh, which was to keep the home fires burning. So the whole issue of home-based uh, comes up again. Um, that's not what used to be called cell church. This is something else. It's just that it's small um, rather than big. So instead of building mega things, uh, we're multiplying and growing uh, things on a smaller community level scale. Um, I'm just going to rattle through Otherwise, I won't get done in 20 minutes. Third one is scattered. Um, we need to look at the whole thing of centralized hubs. Um, one thing that lockdown has taught us is spirit connectivity that's not based on geography. Uh, so there's another thing to con consider as well. Um, it's interesting how many believers that I am in relationship with are being moved geographically, but they're being moved geographically to a place where they're not, where there are not existing relationships with other believers it's like the lord is scattering uh, like a dandelion being blown you know um so that's interesting that there's a new kind of connectivity spirit connectivity and fellowship that is not geographical just mention it in passing uh, fourth one is supernatural um i've been part of the whole um uh, whatever phrase you want to use, new church movement, charismatic thing, whatever you want to call it. Um, and um, I'm, I'm longing to see um, the, the natural outworking of walking in intimacy with God in the supernatural, rather than being something we learn as a ministry to move in. Uh, I hope you know what I mean. Um, so s s supernatural it, where supernatural has been a good choice we're heading to a time where the supernatural will be a necessity if you want to operate I hate that word if you want to be caught up with what God is doing then um, moving supernaturally on multiple levels um, will be the only thing that allows you to do that so it's it's going to become really important it's going to be pervasive it's going to be in every element of life it's going to be in our life as we leave the front door as much as it is stood on a platform on a Sunday morning. Um, so, yes, yeah, supernatural. Next one is spirit led and spirit based. You'll notice that spirit, uh, the first spirit has a capital S underlined. The second has a small s underlined. That's because um, another thing that is emerging is that, um, it, yes, we want to be Holy Spirit led, but also uh, we need to be moving, living from um, our own spirit. So one of the things that happens as a result of that is that it becomes more about, it becomes less about kindred minds, uh, sorry, becomes less about like-minded and becomes more about kindred spirits. Um, that's why I've got spirit with a capital and with a lower. There are many, many believers whose understanding of their spirit and of living out of their spirit and of their spirit um, renewing their mind, not the other way around, and of, you know, bringing soul and body into um, under the authority of the spirit um, seems to have got lost somewhere. So it's really important to, to see that. I believe it will be sacrificial. And again, if you think about the fact, if it's necessary to be operating with a model of underground church, then there are going to be some very big issues, which um, will make will mean that um, it will be costly to be identified as being in the family of God. And I make a distinction between that and any state religion or church. 
Um, the next one is stealthy. Um, Lord's really been uh, talking to me about completely changing my language um, to be wise, to be to be brave and bold, but to be tender, wise and spiritually shrewd. Uh, so I'm going to leave it at that. Um, I told you I was going to fly past. And then spiritual maturity is the last one. Um, just want to highlight, and I'm sorry if this is like teaching my grandmother to suck eggs, but um, I found an absence of this. Sonship, um, as soon as we uh, are, as soon as we are received into the family of God, we become a son, gender blind, please notice, a son. That's a legal status, but that's nothing like becoming a mature son. That's something else. So a mature son is not simply a legal status. A mature son represents and accurately uh, portrays their father. So uh, you, as a mature son, and that includes ladies, um, you operate in maturity with the authority that father has given us. It's a reality. It's not simply status it's it's um so we need we yeah so a re-examination of what it means to be a huios a mature son right and so pause for breath that's what that's literally uh, a sample um of things to think about in terms of where what lies ahead uh, the second one and again um this is not an attempt Please hear me say this. It's not an attempt to dishonor, discredit, or in any way disrespect what has gone before. But there are some things that the Lord very clearly said to me because, because I've changed the season, because I've, quote, raised the bar in preparation for my bride being ready for the return of my son. Some things that have existed need to be eradicated. So that's a list. The next list that begins with C's is that uh, number one, without a doubt, is control. Um, that looks at the whole issue of leadership and hierarchy and whether it's pie in the sky to be a network that is a peer network where parents operate where there are not. Uh, other titles, status, offices, and I realise that's slightly contentious, but control needs to disappear. Consumerism needs to disappear. Um, it's not about, I, I, I like this, I like Tesco's, but I don't like Sainsbury's. I go off Tesco's and I go to Waitrose. I'm a consumer. I choose to go where I feel like I get the best thing that suits me. Um, we can't do that anymore. Um, in terms of uh, how we are together. It's not about style. It's not about practice even. It's not about preference. Uh, it's about being in love with Jesus. And it's about Jesus, not about us. It's not about our needs. It's not about what we need to get out of um, particularly collective gatherings. So there needs to be a, a shift in that. The next one is centralization and hierarchy. I've touched on that. Don't think centralization and hierarchy was ever part of God's blueprint for his church on earth. Oops. Um, certitude. Uh, I know people, I've had some interesting conversations with people who tell me that their theology is fully defined and um, they don't need to question anything anymore. Certitude is, has been killing the life of the spirit and we need to go back to realizing who God is we need to be happy with mystery. We need to be happy with having some questions unanswered. And we need to live in another level of simply not knowing, but trusting him implicitly. Certitude, cautiousness. Church is full of people with a risk averse mindset. Um, stop it, basically. Um, compassion. Um, one of the biggest things that I have to help people with is the mistake of self-comparison. Um, stop comparing yourself with anyone else. 
it's about who father says you are it's about what's written in your destiny etc etc so um comparison needs to be something that we don't have in the body um next one you'd think i wouldn't need to put this but it's probably the most deadly cancerous thing currently in the church i would say which is our ability to be critical of one another uh, in both our speech and our spirit um that has no place in a bride being prepared i'm afraid well i'm not afraid i'm delighted um next one churches we knew it will disappear that's a very bold and bald statement um, i've chosen to just interpret that a tiny bit by saying the lord said to me um i want you to be i want you to be and i want you to disciple others to be gardeners not builders i think in terms of church um, and ministry that probably cuts across but uh, quite a lot of things and people but um, going back to what we had is probably the worst possible choice so even if you don't know what the good choice is it ain't that <laughs> so we have to look at how that changes and what that means um, concepts is the final one we need to operate out of reality so if you're if you are a great proponent of um, the love of God, it's not enough to say, I have this biblical concept of the love of God, so I'm teaching everybody else about it. If it isn't your personal reality, if you haven't personally experienced the love of God, probably a good idea that you don't try and disciple other people in it, because what you end up doing is discipling them in a concept or a doctrine or a piece of theology or even information that if it's not their personal reality, it's really not much use to them. Certainly not when things get difficult. Right, time for another breath. That's the second one. The third is how do we prepare if indeed we think we need to? Um, first thing is position as a novice. That's really, really important. If, if you position as an expert because you were an expert in the old season, you are likely to miss what's happening. So assume the posture, the position and the mindset of a novice. I went to, um, I went to a conference just before lockdown started, which Chris and John were involved in. And um, there was a, a lady called Dr. Sharon Stone who very bravely and very vulnerably described as an experienced prophetic voice with a great track record. She said that she'd spent the previous year arguing with God because God gave her this choice to be um, to carry on being an expert in the old or to become a novice in the new. That's an experienced minister. And it's really difficult. And it's the, the people who find it the most difficult to position as a novice are the people with status, standing and reputation. And that's status, standing and reputation that's good, not bad. So novice, challenge, challenge you to position as a novice, to practice stillness and rest as a rhythm of life, um, rather than doing it in an emergency to stop you burning out. Third one, prioritise intimacy with the three. Again, if, if I'm saying obvious, I apologise, but I meet many people who talk about their relationship with God, but they don't know whether they're talking to Father, to Jesus or Holy Spirit. They just address him as Lord or God. There are three relationships to be had. Three. And, there, and what the Father invests in us is not the same as what Jesus invests in us and is not the same uh, in, as it is in the natural so my parents invested in me and loved me in a certain way my spouse also loves me and invests in me but in a completely different way still love but different so um exploring intimacy with the three uh, is an emphasis um next one um the lord's really given me quite a hard time till i went public a bit um 
he wants us to shift our focus, our emphasis, and our pursuit of the gifts to the fruit. He said there are too many ministries that are gifted but are fruitless. Now, let me just explain. Fruit is not the number of people you, you bring to the Lord. It's not the number of people you heal. Fruit is love, joy, peace, self-control, patience, etc. Because those are the things that hallmark maturity. Gifting has nothing to do with maturity at all. It's the fruit that, that determine or that delineate um, things. So more attention to the gift. It's not that we not that we stop moving in the gift, but we let's be kind ministers rather than gifted ones. If that's not impertinent. Um, finally, the last two, um, probably the most provocative thing I'll say, park 95 percent of your theology because it's a major hindrance to God explaining to you what the new paradigm looks like. I'm not going to make any comment except to say that it's a painful journey. I've been on it. I'm still on it. I can't believe some of the things he says. I often doubt my own hearing of him, um, but he's been very kind and persistent. Um, so, yeah. I Notice I didn't say jettison it. I said park it. So it's like if you go to look, if you go to somewhere, if you're going to go walk up a mountain, you park your car at the bottom and pick it up afterwards. It's that kind of thing. It's like if you're going to spend time with the Lord, don't take all the baggage. Even the baggage that you think is a non-negotiable, just leave it somewhere, go up the mountain. And then if you want to pick it up when you come back, that's fine. You pick it up, but don't take it up the mountain because it gets in the way. Can't believe I just said that. Um, and then the final thing, which, um, yeah, I, I still live in in that reality of having to consistently and persistently put to death prejudices i had no idea being a really well-grounded biblically taught teacher pastor filled with the spirit i had no idea that i had so much religious tendencies i had no idea and so i from that point and with helping and mentoring other people realized i wasn't alone um, so the challenge is um, Make sure you've had your pharisectomy. That might have been slightly over 20 minutes, Chris, and it was at breakneck speed. But as the aim is to get people to talk, <laughs> I don't really apologise for it. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Jonathan. Very good. Yes, interesting, interesting points you raise. <laughs> and many of which we've dialogued certainly with Restoration House. Um, we, we, we've been in Ephesians 4 for some time, particularly the first nine verses, which come before the gifts, yep. which is all about unity and humility and, and things like that. But uh, we don't have any answers, but we're certainly exploring where does the apostolic fit? Where does the prophetic fit? Where does evangelism fit? Um, things like that. So anybody like to start off with dialogue or comment? We're here to honour and respect one another's views, of course, and to, to demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit. Um, but we do want to Malachi 3.16, which is those who feared the Lord talked together and heard one another and the Lord heard them. Yeah, yeah thank you, John. Jonathan, rather. I'm doing a Chris now. <laughs> That's all right. Um, yeah, I, I, I only had a a short time to skate through the notes and if I'd have thought of it to print them off that would have been helpful because I'd, I'd had them in front of me but I only got them earlier on so um, that's not a problem though because I, I got the gist of what you were saying and um, I have to say that I think pretty well everything you've said I would agree with now whether that means I agree with you and how you would interpret those things that's another matter but I think most of it, I have tried to live my life by those kind of guidelines and rules. That doesn't make me mature because I consistently fail to do what God has instructed me to do. And sometimes I don't even know I've failed. I remember being accused of being an authoritarian 
on one occasion by some couple that were leaving the church, Chris and John would know them. And um, I think often they interpreted my um, feelings by the look on my face. And people that know me know that my face doesn't always show what I'm feeling inside. Um, the classic example is that when Christine and I were going through customs, uh, I would smile. And when I smiled, the customs officer said, come over here, mister. Would you mind opening your case? I'd like to see what's inside it. And whereas when Christine smiled, they would wave at her and wave us through. So we learned to use her smile and me pushing the trolley to come through <laughs> customs. I could repeat that story on a number of occasions. I got a, a multiple entry into, into the USA to get a visa after she went to get it, after I failed uh, uh, numerous times to get this, this entry because they didn't believe me. That was a trouble. <laughs> so, so I have a problem in, in people believing me and, and all sorts of other problems as well. So I'm, I'm not saying I'm mature, but I think I've tried to live my life by those things. What I would say is that truth and revelation is uh, in the whole body. The truth is not confined to one person. I don't have the truth. I have a part of the truth and a revelation. And I believe truth comes to us through, through scripture, which I'm sure you would agree with, through our conscience and the work of the Holy Spirit in convicting us, and also through, um, uh, through the Bible, through, well, I said through scripture, through relationships rather. So I think um, I have found, and I've spent literally hours over the years, fellowshipping with people who would seem to be diametrically opposed to us. In the very early days of the, the new churches, our um, relationship, which uh, spanned quite many, many years of much involvement, was with the Catholics. And we were so far apart from one another that we were quite secure to be together because <laughs> it's often people who are closest to you you end up arguing with. So that was a very fruitful thing. And so I believe that um, whilst there are many things which you've said, it's one side of a story and you've been getting revelation from God, which is great, but others get revelation from God, and it's by us coming together, maintaining the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, and sharing and fellowship, and demonstrating love, even when we disagree, which I find hugely difficult, I must say, um, as, as important. And I think our fellowship with the Catholics has been absolutely amazing, because ultimately they published a paper on what they call the new charismatic churches. That was the only way they could understand us. They started by calling us non-denominational. And um, that paper was then published in the, uh, in the Vatican, on the Vatican website and went to every church leader throughout the whole of the Catholic church, which is encouraging people to work together in mission, to work together in prayer, to work together for unity. And so that's a sort of established fact. So that's another side to the, to the aspect. And uh, so, but I do think I like to say thank you for all of those things, some of them hit hard at you, but we have to accept them, basically, even the hard things you've said, I feel. But they're one side of a story. Uh, I mean, for example, structure. Um, structure is really like scaffolding. It can get you somewhere, but it doesn't, we must pass it away. We must give it away when it's, when it's finished its usefulness. And so um, I think we could debate on, on that kind of stuff as well. So I mustn't go on because um, I've spent years going on and uh, learning to stop is another thing <laughs> to be able to do. So thank you, Jonathan. Appreciate You're what you have A very good job. Very yeah, good. Thank you, John. And we do know, you know, not to read you by your face. <laughs> well, you do. <laughs> <laughs> I never used to like looking in his eyes if I'd done something wrong. <laughs> I'm definitely looking, not looking in Christine's eyes. Phil and Sue. Jonathan, I, you've covered a lot, a lot of points here, but one of the words that you've used is collective. And I wondered if it's possible to ask you to expand on what you mean, because you've obviously used individual as well, individual uniqueness. What do you mean by collective? Well, it's just, I, I really dislike the word corporate, which is what we use when we talk about church. Uh, when we talk about what we do when we come together as a corporate body. Right. So um, collective is just an alternative. It's basically to distinguish how those things that pertain to me on my own with the Lord and those things that pertain to us when we come together 
in that unique dynamic that occurs um, when we come together um, to do together what we do individually. Um, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm very, uh, I don't want to go anywhere near structure in the light of what John has just said, but um, uh, an, ame an amoeba is something that's very fluid. So it's never the same shape. It's constantly undergoing change. That's a better representation of where we're going when we are together collectively than the current rigidity. Right, okay. I was trying to tie it in with my mind with, 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 the, with the concept of community as well. It, I mean, to be honest with you, again, this is one of the challenges of language, but ecclesia, community, church, family, it's all the same thing. It, um, it's just that over the years, we've used different words and we've given them different associations. But um, I think basically it's how the family of God interact with one another. It's not, it's not how they put on meetings. It's how we live together. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I think that term community to me embraces much more of the, the organicness of what God's doing now. And, and thank you, Jonathan, that so many of the points you brought up, I think, as Christine said, are points that we've been mulling on and, and learning ourselves. One of the things that has been on my heart a lot is about the rhythm of life. And I wondered if you could just expand a little bit on your lifestyle that you, you mentioned, and also this idea of practicing stillness, rest, and, the, and a rhythm of life. What sort of, what, how does that um, look for you? I, I suppose I want to preface that by saying that um, it's not like adopting a practice. So it's it's not a method. It it just turns out that when we certainly if we invest in intimacy with God, then one of the things that comes out is a change of priorities. And one of the change of priorities is I'd rather hang with a him than do something else. So that's where it all sort of starts to bubble, where it starts to come from. And then it's just slowly over a period of time, you realize that to be the best version of you, to be the most influential, or to, be, to have the greatest impact on your world, to be the most glorifying to God, all of those things come from hanging out more and more with him. And not hanging out exclusively with um, good things like study and that. Actually, I don't know how, I don't know how much to say. Um, intimacy is, is a very special kind of relationship. It's an entwinement. So this is not a formal relationship. It's, it, it's a relationship that morphs and grows and develops and... I'm sure some of you will know that after 40 or 50 years of marriage, you tend to take on quite a few characteristics of your partner. <laughs> you sort of merge slightly. Um, and um, so I, I think that in terms of rhythm, you soon realize that anything that you do out of routine or out of um, ritual or I must be disciplined, it's great if you want to establish a new, a new way to be disciplined but if you're being disciplined and doing it from obligation etc five years down the line you've missed the point it's not grown into that relate so for me rhythm means that i don't live in a hurry i have ruthlessly eliminated hurry absolutely from my life to a financial disadvantage um but i'm the happiest i've been all my life and that comes from um yeah i just i'd rather talk to him than most other people um so build it into your life initially as a rhythm and then it becomes a rhythm that you don't notice you're stepping out of it's not like you go visit him in the morning visit him in the day you know during the daytime then visit him in the it, 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 it the entwinement is such that 
that the intimacy is permanent. So what happens is instead of feeling, oh, I haven't spoken to him for ages, I better go and do that. Instead of noticing that, what you notice is, did I just do something? Because he just left. My awareness of his presence just moved. Mm -hmm. So instead of looking to engage, you become sensitive to disengagement. Mm -hmm. So the pivot is like a seesaw. It's the other way. Mm -hmm. um, so rhythm is really just about not being in a hurry, about asking him and I mean, I'm unashamed about it, asking him about everything, or if, he, or if, maybe not even asking him, just intuitively knowing because you spend time with him, what he would do, and therefore what you will do. Um, so the rhythm is not fixed, um, except in the early days when you're trying to establish something. It's like a habit, really. Um, but apart from that, rhythm is, is, is the predominance of walking with him. I think it's, it's interesting, um, you know, years ago with the Toronto, there, there were people that were laying on the floor for days and there was a sense of some people wanted them to get up and get on and do something and others thought it was good for them to stay on the floor. And I, I was kind of in the middle, always wondering, well, where does the Great Commission fit in all of this? You know, Jesus sent them out into all the world to, to do the stuff. And Hermie, I see Hermie put a hand up. Hermie is, is someone who has amazing rhythm. Uh, she wakes up at two o'clock in the morning and six o'clock in the morning, she prays and has done that nearly all of her Christian life. So she has a rhythm, uh, but she's also constantly preaching the gospel, constantly ministering when she goes into work. So to me, she's an example of someone who is living what you've just described, but also fulfilling the Great Commission every day. So I don't know what, tell me what you wanted to share, but if you unmute yourself, uh, certainly want to hear what you... Thank you very much, John, uh, Jonathan. It's, it's very encouraging uh, message that you shared to us. I was really struck with uh, particularly this intimacy uh, that out of intimacy, because I could relate to that, out of intimacy, it flows, isn't it? You don't stop it. You don't create it because it's coming out. And I think that's that's really encouraging because that's how, you know, uh, the church looks like or the community, the family looks like. I have a question, and, and probably it's it's me. I need to be clarified on this because you did mention about the uh, characteristic of the ecclesia, and it says about scattered. So my I just want to be clarified because how, how does it fit into what Jesus prayed in his last prayer where he wants the, the body of Christ to be united? So how do you see it? Okay, well, first of all, I'm not an expert. I, I have a lot of unanswered questions myself. So I'm not, I'm not here to kind of give answers to everything. My, my take on what I put is that... Um, If the way in which, oh, where do I begin? Um, it, isn't, it isn't just the church that is undergoing transition. Our entire planet, and for all I know, our entire universe is undergoing the same transition. So I believe it's a God-initiated transition. It, the creator spoke, Kairos touched Kronos, and nothing has been the same since. But um, in terms of the, the scattered, um, I suppose as much as anything, it's um, it's trying to understand that um, the G D does everybody know what I mean by the Gene Darnell prophecy? Yeah. The small yeah. fires mm -hmm. everywhere. So, so just like um, in Acts, the the church being scattered was the vehicle for an explosion of people coming to Jesus around the world. So in the scattering, there was great effect. Um, so I'm not surprised to see people being moved by God geographically, um, where they're, as it were, the first. They're the pioneer. They're the they're the one that God uses to draw others to. 
So um, scattered does not imply that we're all on our own, doing our own thing, dependent on the Lord and not on it, and, and not interdependent on each other. So maybe scattered was a bad word, I don't know to use, um, but many people un, sadly come up with the verse, don't forget, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, completely out of context. And Ecclesia is as valid when there's two or three people as when there's two or 3,000. Ecclesia is Ecclesia. It doesn't require 150 people to have Ecclesia worship or Ecclesia teaching. So I think this, the, there is this kind of re-examination of Ecclesia in the home, Ecclesia in the community. It's amazing during lockdown how many believers staggeringly have discovered their neighbours. They've started talking to their actual neighbours and realised that they invested so much time in the church organisation and family that they completely ignored the people that God had put them next to. And they've discovered not only that they can have a relationship with those people, but that there is a sense of God saying, this is why I put you here. These people are just as important, maybe more, as the other Christians who happen to go to the same church as you do. Um, so I think scattered is simply one of those words to re-evaluate what we presume. We've been very prescriptive in what Ecclesia looks like, and we need to be open to God creating Ecclesia in the most unlikely places, with the most unlikely people, and certainly not people who are in doctrinal uh, agreement. It's really possible for that to work, for that to happen, to live without 95% doctrinal agreement with one another and enjoy an amazing unity in worship and mission. I mean, apart from anything else, it, sorry, I've, you've got me going now. Apart from anything else, God, God doesn't look at a town. God doesn't look at Southampton and go, ah, oh, there's my restoration believers, there's my Baptist believers. That He just doesn't do that. And one of the things that he's asking us is, even if we continue with our groups and our churches and our streams and everything else, he's saying, I am longing for you to come together simply as believers, gathering around the Father for your city, for your village, for your town, for your road, for your neighbourhood. Um, so I apologise for using scattered if it was con uh, confusing. Thanks, Jonathan. Anyone else like to comment? Dave Connolly. Hi, Jonathan. Um, I, I don't think, I, though I don't know you, I think um, it, it, it's really interesting, you know, we, we, you raise so many points. Um, Sorry about that. No, 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 was, was no criticism. Well, <laughs> I think this is what the church does. It raises big issues and we try to um, work them out in a converse, in, in a brief conversation, not realizing that we have to go on this significant journey. And um, if it's okay, can I, I, I just want to mention a couple of obs observations. I mean, our history is that we have come from very small house church to one of the biggest churches in, in the nation. And God called us to walk away from it, not because there was a problem. No, no. But we, we, we were able to do that. And one of the biggest challenges I faced was the over-organisation of the family. But that was a failure on my part, not on the congregations, you know, um, and as part of the leadership there. But I, I think also when you know we have this type of dialogue, I think one of the things that we fall into is that we look through a Western filter, mm -hmm. continually looking through a Western filter, so when we talk about ecclesia, et cetera, I, I, I'm not going to go into it. I see that slightly different. Um, I think it, oh, oh, yeah, it, 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 I see it, you know, quite differently there. But um, I always have to go back to the early church, mm -hmm. you know, in Jerusalem and Antioch. And there I see in, mm -hmm. Ju in Jerusalem, um, Holy Spirit comes. It's the Holy Spirit that's doing the work three men and women, 
And amazing things are happening in Jerusalem. It's not going beyond there. So that's when the scattering comes, when you know God allows the persecution to come. And that scatters the church without the persecution. It would never have gone. But I mean, we've just been looking at um, the Book of Acts in church since Christmas. You know, so I'm like, I want to see, I want to love God authentically. Um, and we have all these words, don't we? We have, we have this language and we're from different streams, you know, from rhythms of this. And I think we do have to change our language to who we're talking to. But I long just to love God and make him known. And as I'm making him known, I have an expectation to see men and women come to faith not through my effort, but through the power of the Holy Spirit. So we've moved from this massive picture to a little gathering, but immediately our expectation was we wanted to see people saved. So I moved to Tesco. I moved into Tesco and started to reach out to people. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I am quite a shy person, but it is always to see, when I see God move, I see life. And whenever I see life, I see growth, personal and, um, you know, corporate, you know, you know joint. I, I see a real growth of the Holy Spirit. But I think the biggest challenge that, as you know, we, we have these conversations and that's it's the filter we look through and it's a Western one. So when we use certain words, you know, when we talk about church, it's through the Western experience, not the Middle Eastern experience, not you know, not the church of, you know, that was of the of the early church. And I think our church looks very much unlike the early church but i think we're doing some i think for, for for some reason god has chosen the church with all its different expressions to be his vehicle to bring about his end time means mm. and i think there's whenever that happens i see across the world i see almost a deconstruction mm -hmm. and i think when we're, when we're trying to rearrange things we have to be careful that we don't re that we don't move the holy spirit out to something very precious. Mm -hmm. Hope that was okay. Yeah. Can I can I just ask you something, Jonathan? Is it, if that's okay? Um, we don't know. I don't know your church background. I don't know what church you belong to. If you led a church or whatever. But what I did notice that um, in a response to someone's question, and you used that we talked about structure, and there was there was a physical change as you use that word. And so my question for you would be, what has happened to you personally that almost, there's a almost like an mm. anger mm. about it or a hate about mm. it that may or may not mm. have influenced mm. what you've passed around today? Mm. And sorry, Jonathan, just I had something to say that. Um, over the last few years, a number of our friends in America I've returned to the house church movement, wherever that was. And they've asked me several times to read books by their new stream. And within one chapter, I could, I could guess, I was going to say, I could tell you about the person who had written that book. Sure. They all were carrying wounds and brokenness. Mm. And, they, and, and what they were saying, they'd forgotten God's faithfulness and goodness. And I'm not saying they weren't, being, they weren't wounded. Mm. I'm just saying, but their history, you know, their future will be the same as their history, unless they can deal with that. Um, thanks for the question, Julie. I really appreciate it. And uh, I will certainly go ask if there's something, uh, some kind of route somewhere that means that. Um, I think that the only thing I can put my finger on right now is that um, I've spent, uh, I mean, you may think not wisely, but I felt that's what Holy Spirit told me to do. He said, I want you to read the life of Jesus over and over and over. Don't read the epistles. Don't read the Old Testament. Not for now, for a season. Read the life of Jesus. You're a follower of Jesus. Jesus is your example. So work out, study what he would do and do that. And one of the things that came out of that was um, how you can see Jesus um, loved or did not criticize, condemn, judge, or even um, cajole or threaten. 
he didn't do that with the most what 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 we would call uh, the lowest of the low it, he saved that for for a particular group of people who made him angry because they imposed their um letter of the law to oppress other people and um I became very upset and then very cross when I realized that there were many similarities in my history and in the history of the church that are much closer to representing and portraying the life of the Pharisee than of Jesus. So structure is something that I came to really in my spirit rather than my head, came to find that um, it, it it doesn't delight God's heart. His there is that's not to say it's chaos instead of order. It's not to say any of that, but but um, to build a faith or even a relationship based more on a book than a relationship is one of the most damaging things that we can do to people. So I am quite cross about what we have done in the name of God um, in terms of imprisoning people in structure. Yeah. Whether that was it or whether there's something else I need to know, mm. I don't know. Of course, I mean, can I just respond? I know there's other people that want to say things. I think, Jonathan, that there are churches that have wounded people without yeah. doubt. But when you talk about the church, it's, it feels to me, listening to it, it is a blanket thing of the whole church. And I have to say that I don't think that is true of the whole yeah. church. Um, I think there are many, many fantastic churches who, without people, would not have come to know Jesus, would not mm. have grown in their faith, would not have gone on to the mission field, would not have been supported, all that kind of stuff. So I think, you know, what I read from your notes there is a passion for intimacy. I clearly hear that there is an absolute passion. For me, I think we can have a passion for intimacy as a priority, mm. and I hear that, but I think we can have church structure as well. That mm. would be my perspective. And, that, and that's fine, like I say, I'm, I'm not trying to persuade anybody to change their perception or their understanding, but it's just because I was asked to share from my journey then i'm just sharing my my sort of something from my story really so i'm not putting it forward as definitive teaching i'm not putting it forward as a new model but i i do i am completely convinced that what lies ahead will change things I so agree. whether that's two three five seven ten years i don't know i wouldn't presume but uh it is going to change and it will be hard to do what we've done yeah in the same way thank you jonathan for your honesty and your humility I yeah. think tim Amen. grant were you asking to say something yeah i'm interested jonathan because do you think that uh the word structure because we think of structure as as solid and immovable is a less biblical idea of structure because I'm thinking about the new wine skin which contains the wine but can be change its shape by external pressures and I sometimes think when we think about structure we think about a building um, which is rigid and unchangeable uh, do you think that the new structure is going to be more flexible more like a wine skin I think, you know, scaffolding and things tend to suggest we're building something solid and unshakable, whereas I think God's building something far more flexible. I wonder what you think on that. Well, it, it's kind of, I'm slightly intrigued, I have to say, that um, we have such a um, desire to work out structure. <laughs> mm. I, I suspect that we don't really need to do that um, and that it's something of a, a red herring but in answer to your question tim i think my answer would be i believe god's saying stop behaving like a builder and start behaving like a gardener mm. grow something don't build something 
Yeah, I mean, God says I will build my church, doesn't he? I don't think it's even our responsibility to do that. No, but there's probably a few hundred thousand people that could do with you hearing that. I'll say that. But no, I, I agree. And I and the thing is, this whole season is characterized by dependence on the Lord. So there's not a prescription. There's not even a blueprint. The blueprint is to stay right by the side of God. He's going to keep us in the dark till we need to know, because then we don't control it. We don't own it. We try and steer it. We don't claim it. It's totally what he's going to do. And we've got to um, be sufficiently connected to him and close to him to be able to follow him and run with what he's doing. So I wouldn't presume to say what the new wine skin would look like or what the new structure would be. But I suspect that structure along with mission happens when we are intimate with God. Mm. It just happens. It's the same with, you know, if, if you really have the reality of God in your life, mission is a strange concept. All, all that you do is people bump into you and bump into Jesus. It, so so even, even the concept of being missional or evangelistic is a, becomes slightly odd when you go through this paradigm shift. So I think structure... I could be wrong, but I, I don't, we definitely shouldn't get hung up on it because we've become hung up on it for years, decades, maybe even centuries. I think mission is expressed in many different ways. And I think over the, the, the history of the church, we've tried to emphasize one or another. And I don't think it is. I think it's, you know, it's personal, it's mass, it's, it's uh, to the small group, to the large group, to the individual. And I think well, we see that been. throughout the New Testament. It has been. It remains to be seen what it becomes. And, and that's why I say we need to park theology when we go up the mountain to hang out with God for a while, because sometimes we prevent him from explaining something to us because we don't have the we don't have the radar for that. It's off our radar. And so we assume it's not him. I just say that generally, not specifically to you. I think it's almost impossible, Jonathan. Uh, to not take on false doctrine over the years that we've been involved in church. Sure. For me, it's been evangelical charismatic, and only last week God uncovered false doctrine that I'd taken on board for over 30 years. <laughs> so I fully embrace and respond to what you're saying. So, um, yeah, more Lord. Indeed. We kind of knew when, when, when we uh, we have knew this session was on tonight that this this would have to be an ongoing dialogue. Of course. There's so much, and as as Dave Connolly said, you know, this is a journey that we can go on. That, that we Malachi three sixteen that yeah. that maybe you know over a year we'll we'll see things differently. But I, certainly I for one, and I know Dave and Julie and, and Tim and Kim and John and John, we want to keep talking around this so that. Yeah that we know what the Lord is saying to us. Um, I think it's both and. I think, I think we're called to go into all the world and make disciples. And there are things called fivefold ministries and there, there are apostles and prophets, but I would say that, wouldn't I? Of but course. I'm just gonna hand over to John Noble. Uh, John, I know you wanted to say something, but also when you finish saying, could you just pray into whatever you feel to pray for us to finish off this evening so that we leave uh, in unity. Over to John. Thank you, uh, Chris. Yeah, I, I, it's just very interesting, isn't it? And uh, obviously, we look back to times in our lives. I, I was thinking about uh, people in structures and how we relate to them. I, I was very much an evangelical when I first came back to the Lord, and um, it took me a while to be concerned about the rightness of evangelicals. I found them to be dead right with the emphasis on the dead. And um, then I met Catholics who I totally disagreed with and for a long time didn't even think they could be Christians and found that they had a devotion to God and they were able to teach me so much whilst they were in their structure, which I totally disagreed with to, to a, a major degree. Although you can use structure, 
And because uh, if we want to go to Africa, if God sends us to Africa, you need to structure, you need a ticket, and you need an airline, unless, of course, you can get transported, which is something I've never managed to do yet. It's a lot cheaper. Um, but I, the thing I wanted to say was, you, you mentioned the, the phrase two or three gathered. That scripture has been a central part of my life over the years, that, that the, the smallest function of church is two or three people gathered, not that they have come together for a meeting because the word there is is symphonia which is speaks of symphony where two or three people come together and make a symphony with their lives and they have a relationship which will last forever then you may have to tidy it up and you may have to put it right but basically it lasts forever and those twos and threes make up the church cells if you like the, the life of the body and where they function in unity then you can begin to ask God to do. The more unity that you have in the spirit, the more you can ask. And so that's a reflection on my life that I am not able to ask for, for very much sometimes, probably means that I've still got a long way to go in the unity situation. Although I have spent my whole life, that's a central plank of, of what I believe. And the structure of the church, I just finished with this and then we can pray. I was at Disneyland some years ago, and some of you may have heard me say this before, and we were watching with our grandchildren or great-grandchildren or something, part of the family, we were watching Terminator, and there was this evil man who changed himself into Quicksilver, and he went under a door and reinvented himself as something even more evil the other side. And I felt the Lord said to me, that's the church, son, only it's not evil. The church is like quicksilver, it's like water, it's like oil, it's like fire, it's, it's a movable thing. And when the enemy comes against it and puts an obstacle in the way, the church can flow under the door and reinvent itself the other, other side, which is what happened in the persecution of the Chinese church and obviously the underground church that followed. And so um, I, I, I really relate to what you're saying. But I'm not afraid of structure. I'm afraid if that structure at the end of the day is the thing that governs us, or is it the thing that gets us to where we want to go? That, to me, is, is the, the, um, the acid test, if you like. If the structure gets us where we need to go. I, I, I've been haunted, as I've said many times before, by the whole word about, uh, I'm doing a new thing, do you not perceive it? And the answer is no, we don't. But he is doing a new thing. And that new thing is the thing I'm praying about. I don't want to miss it. I know that what has happened in the past is always a threat to being able to see what God is doing in the future. But essentially, it is the same thing. It's streams in the desert. It's, it's the love of God being manifested through his people. And so perhaps we could just pray. As, is it right to pray now, Chris? Good. Okay. Well, Father, we, we, we want to thank you for your goodness to us over the years. When I think of my own walk with you, Lord, I must have frustrated you numerous times, but you've never given up on me. And even now, at 84 years of age, I'm asking, Lord, please, could I be a part of what you're doing in the future? As long as I live, can I be a part of it, Lord? And that will mean, I'm sure, humbling myself, and it will mean inviting you to come in and help me to make changes, which will be perhaps very painful. And so I thank you for Jonathan tonight, who has again challenged us and caused us to think about what we hold dear and what we're prepared to lay aside in order to achieve your purposes in our lives. So we come before you again, Lord, and say, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, pour out your life into us that we might reflect the glory of Jesus in this tired, sick, old world in which we live, which is especially important now, Lord, as the control system is now coming into place, which will make it more and more difficult for us to do what we want to do, particularly in our structures. So, Father, help us to understand what you're doing behind the scenes and to fight for your kingdom and fight for your glory with all of our hearts when you give us the opportunity. We ask that and your blessing upon each one of us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, everyone who shared. Thank you, everyone who listened. Uh, I really hope we can carry on this dialogue. Yeah.
Thank you, everyone. Bless you.